Hey guys, welcome back to the Foam Frat Podcast. In this episode, I talk to Dr. Jeff Jarvis, questioning the utility of red lights and sirens in 911 response. Excellent paper that came out. We talk about that along with Jonathan Jenkins, who's one of our Foam Frat educators. So as we got into that discussion, it led into some stuff about the paper, what they considered a time critical intervention. I think you guys will enjoy it, but, uh, Sam, you remember the first time you got to go red lights and sirens? Yeah, I waited a long time because I started working when I was 18. And I remember the the rule with the insurance was that you had to be 21 years old. And so I played passenger for years before I got to respond. And so that time just all kind of meshes together. And I remember I didn't want to become a driver. I actually just kind of liked just being in the back and not having to worry about it. I didn't mind writing the reports but yeah i remember being kind of nervous and excited about it because there's like some inherent liability um i remember when i first started working with joel porter i used to tell him that there were four different reasons there were the four s's why we went lights and sirens i guess it was more about transporting than responding because we didn't have a lot of control over that but it was strokes stemmies severe traumas and if sam had to use the bathroom we used a different (laughs) We use a different word for for that last one, but those are the general reasons. But obviously, there's some there's some nuance in there, yeah. Yeah, and I remember it was before GPSs were like mainstream when I first started mm-hmm. driving. So I was like, not only do I need to know how to navigate to all these different like hospitals and places, but now I'm also like driving with everyone staring at me. And so mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever had to. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had to make a a turnaround because you missed your um, you missed your exit or. You drove by the street, but it it's a little embarrassing. And then you get the call from dispatch. They said that you drove by. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, that must have been a different ambulance. I'm not sure. We're just but doing yeah, a low no, recon I'm, right now. <laughs> yeah, just doing that. We want to check out the area and ensure scene safety first. But, yeah, this was a really interesting discussion. And I think a, a good preface for it is the thing that you're evaluated on anytime that, let's say you're responding lights and sirens and something bad happens. I guess anytime you're responding is somebody's going to come back and they're going to use that due regard phrase, you know, were you acting with due regard, which is basically, did you give sufficient consideration and attention to the response itself? Like, were you acting within the best interest of not only yourself and self-preservation, but also your passengers, your partner, if you have a patient on board and, and the public as well. And I was doing a little bit of research on this before we hopped on about like, what are the, the big things with due regard? And it all sounds boring on paper, but then when you're responding, you know, it becomes very real. And some of the high points were, you know, balancing speed and safety that lights and sirens doesn't mean that your brakes have to be smoking by the time that you get there. There was this, you know, again, it sounds very driver's ed, but it's all about respecting the right away right like EMS mm-hmm. when your lights and sirens are on you're requesting right away but you can't demand it demanding right away is you're pulling out and you're assuming cross traffic is going to stop or you're taking a left and you're just assuming that the oncoming traffic is going to stop and those are where, where you see some of the worst accidents is like the t-bones and the head-ons because somebody just assumed that other people were going to stop or you didn't see them and there were certain things like there's just laws that you can't overtake. Like one was passing school buses when their lights are on and the stop sign is out, you're navigating through crowds or a constant risk assessment where if the weather changes or the traffic becomes really heavy or you're near pedestrians, those are some of the things that were, again, driver's ed style stuff. But when you put those lights and sirens on, you have to remember what the actual level of due regard is that you're exercising. So I don't know, everything kind of came back down to a tailored response, which is inherently difficult when you don't know precisely what you're responding for and what's going to be waiting for you on scene. And I thought Jeff had some really good points on making those decisions and, and most importantly, backed up by data. The paper was really good. Yeah, anytime you're doing something that you weren't doing before on duty, it's an intervention, you know, and mm-hmm. as he mentioned, any intervention, just like intubation, a medication you give, you know, mm-hmm. uh, splinting, you have to have the evidence to support it. There needs to be that that supporting rationale as to why you're doing it. And if you're just doing it because it's been tradition and it's what the public expects when they call 911, um, and not to spoil it, but you'll see the amount of time you actually save, for those who haven't read the paper, uh, is not that much. 
um, you really have to call into question whether it makes sense to do that. So yeah, excellent interview and uh, great points by yourself as well. Should we roll the tape? Yeah, let's do it. So Jeff, you just dropped a paper. I feel like you're dropping papers all the time, but uh, this one was very interesting. It was looking at uh, the use or utility of lights and sirens. And so I posted on Facebook that I was going to have you on the podcast. And I would say that the comment section was uh, very interesting, very good questions. And before we really get into that, what I want to do is just look at why you were asking this question because it's been something that we've been seeing people talk about however i've had many podcasts interrupted because i hear lights and sirens going by my uh by my house and so yeah. it's it's not something that's become mainstream um it's one of the cool things that you get to do as an ems provider is flip on those lights and sirens and uh, you know the public sees it and they think, yeah, I want them to get there quick. I'm going to pull over. You know, they have to help someone. So, so what were you doing with this? Yeah. So, you know, Tyler, I started at EMS when I was 18 years old. Actually, yeah, I just turned 18, joined the volunteer fire department. And at that time, we could, we would respond to the fire station in our POVs. And I had a little, I swear to God, a Kojak that I got to slap up <laughs> on top of my car add a siren in there. And it's like, this is great, man. An 18 year old boy full of testosterone. And you're telling me there are no rules allowed. You can drive like an idiot. Um, and to be clear, that's what young 18 year old Jeff heard. That is not at all what the fire chief said, but that is what I heard. And that is absolutely what I did. It is absolutely amazing that I survived. Now I'm coming up on my 40th year in EMS and I have, like most of us, been involved with collisions. I've been responsible for the collision. And I've been unrestrained in the back during a collision. Thankfully, I can still walk straight. Um, and I seem to have done well. But we all know of agencies and colleagues who are no longer with us or can no longer do this job because they were involved in a motor vehicle collision. So... As I have progressed in my career and I'm now a medical director, I have always looked at my number one job is to get my partners in the field home safely at the end of their shift. And I try to evaluate how I can do that. Um, and it turns out that one of the largest risks to them not going home safely at the end of the shift is vehicle collisions. And we have seen through the literature that the use of lights and sirens is associated with an increase in the risk of collisions. Now, you may jump in on that word associated, and I know some people will, particularly those people who are in the hardcore, you will get my federal siren when you pry it from my cold dead fingers <laughs> group. Um, and they will say, well, it's just an association. Yes, and that's all you will ever have because we're not going to do a randomized control trial on this. Um, it's just it's not an ethical thing to do. Um, so that association is about as good as you're going to get. So I was really interested in this topic as a life safety issue. And I was at um, my prior agency, Williamson County and Marble Falls EMS. And I was giving my, my standard chat about you should use lights and sirens like you do any other clinical intervention. Yes, you are authorized and credentialed to intubate patients. But thankfully, you don't intubate every patient because every patient doesn't need it. Just like you should only use your clinical interventions when you need them, I think that we should treat lights and sirens like a clinical intervention. I'm not saying don't use them. Just like I'm saying don't ever, I'm not saying never intubate. I'm saying just do it when it's appropriate. So I was giving that spiel at Marble Falls EMS and one of their training captains, Vaughn Hamilton, said, well, Jeff, you know, you, is there some literature on this? And is there specifically a way we can look at this thing that you're trying to do, which is associate clinical interventions with lights and sirens? And can we do this better? And I'm like, well, damn, Vaughn, that's a really good question. As a matter of fact, there is no paper on this. And he said, darn it. And I'm like, not an excuse, buddy. Let's get to work. And fortunately, he has a master's in English and is a great writer. So perfect team. We use the ESO data set 
And we said, show me every procedure in that data set. And then we're going to get a group together and collectively determine just random vote. Is this a life-saving intervention or not? We gave it a good definition, picked up our list of life-saving interventions. And then we looked at, again, the ESO data set and said for each call type, most of these are EMD determinants, but there are some agencies in the ESO data set that don't use ESO. So there were some other variety of call types. But basically, we just said, based on whatever is in there for call type, let's calculate the proportion of life-saving interventions and just get an idea how often when we are going lights and sirens, do we do anything critically when we get there? The theory is, is if you're not doing critical interventions, then the time that you saved, and there, Dr. Kupas did a, an analysis of all of the literature that had been published on this, it's somewhere around three minutes, both in urban areas, yeah. in suburban areas, in rural areas, during the day, during the night, all in there, it's about three minutes. And we said, well, just to be really conservative about this, if you do a life-saving intervention at any time, not just in the time saved, but at any time, then we will say, we'll just, we'll count that. Justified. And we will say what proportion of calls in this determinant were life-saving. And what we found is of like 8 million, 10 million, it's been a while since we published this, but about 10 million calls, 6.9% of those calls that we went lights and sirens to, did we do anything life-saving? So that was a paper that, uh, Vaughn and I and uh, Mike Tagman published using the ESO data set. Well, then we came back to Williamson County and I said, hey, I want to use this and I want to evaluate doing that exact same methodology, but in our service area. Um, so we did it and that is what we just published as the results of that study at Williamson County. So what do you guys consider a life-saving intervention? When you're looking at this, um, I know, Jonathan, you read the paper as well. You know, for me, for sure, doing CPR, I feel like, could be considered a life-saving intervention. You know, granted, you could get Not on there most and, of our patients, but... <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. But it's something that, you know, yeah. if, if, if my you know, wife or my parents go into cardiac arrest and I'm sitting at a stoplight and the paramedics are sitting there and they look over at me and you know what I mean? Like, and I knew in my head yeah. they were going to my parents' house. There would be a little bit of, um, what, you know, what do you, yeah, exactly. What are you guys doing? So, you know, there's certain things that, you know, we identify as like, at least, you know, and, and Granted, I fly now, right? So we don't have lights and sirens on helicopters, you know, yet. I'm working Honestly, it, you but... could mount lights and sirens on there. They'd work about as well on your vehicle as they do on mine, so. Right, but there are interventions where I, we get on scene and we're like, yeah, we're going to get them to this facility as quick as possible because yeah. they need PCI or they have a surgical emergency, mm -hmm. right? There's certain things where it's like, yeah, the, the thing, the golden ticket for them is awaiting on the other side. We got to get them there. But, you know, as, as you pointed out in this paper, too, that's that's not the majority. How many times do we see an ambulance ripping down the highway and they're going because, you know, an elderly woman has a UTI at a nursing home? And yeah. there's a tendency to think it's probably something crazy, you know, that the train just derailed and knocked out a propane tank or something. But right. it's just not the case. So I'm curious when you guys are sitting down and you're going, all right, what is a life saving intervention uh, what were some of the things? What, what did that discussion sound like? You bet. So we didn't use the exact methodology um, because we wanted to be a little more specific. We were also making a change in the system, and we really wanted to get buy-in both by the clinicians who are responding and their chief officers and, most importantly, our elected officials. We wanted that buy-in, so we tweaked the methodology a little bit. And what we did is we assembled two groups of subject matter experts. We had the clinical group that had clinicians. Um, and what they did is looked at every intervention that we had available. And they each voted, is this a life-saving intervention? And let me I'll actually find you our definition. Um, it seems like something I should probably tell you. 
Yeah, while he's looking that up, Jonathan, what are you thinking? What what is a, if you're writing down the top five life saving interventions? What comes to mind? Yeah, so I'm cheating a little bit, right? Because I have the paper in front of me. And I'm, looking oh, okay. at, I'm looking at the list, <laughs> and I can tell um, you exactly what those are. Yeah, <laughs> I can tell you exactly. Um, but I think so. I think that that life saving intervention discussion, although globally generic, is also probably very system specific. You know, so. So whereas there's always the things that we could we could determine are you know life saving interventions right epinephrine and anaphylaxis and, and, and those kinds of things I think that it, you know I think that like looking at your list there's probably some things that you picked in Williamson County that are probably more specific to Williamson County based on the population that you serve that maybe I would pick in Western Pennsylvania or maybe Tyler would pick in Minneapolis based on those based on those people. So I'm really curious to hear kind of how that discussion looked, because I think it's going to look a little bit different everywhere. Yeah, interestingly, um, now we know in Minneapolis, Tyler, number one through number 10 is going to be ECMO. Absolutely. He's going to have to do it. Yeah, I figured I'd hedge off in the past, Tyler. I knew you were going to go there, so I just <laughs> got it out of the way early. Well, not, got it out not, the way. To mention, not to mention, I did hear one time that Texas was a delegated practice state. So there are some things that I had, you know, that, that uh, that are above Tyler and I drink absolutely. drink up y'all delegated practice absolutely <laughs> Jonathan the interesting thing you said is that you think you would come up with a different list because of the characteristics of western PA or Minneapolis or north central Texas and I would actually say I think it is probably way more impacted by the group of people that you happen to pick because I think the fundamental need of patients. All of our patients share the same characteristics. They're human and they break in the same way, whether it's a gunshot wound or a traffic accident, or they got kicked by a mule on a Amish farm. I think that in general, we all break in the same way and the interventions that we can use are probably roughly the same. Now you're right. We will clearly have some variation, but the interesting thing is even when you use different lists and the list that we came up with, because we had different participants was di in this local Williamson County paper was different than the list we used when we did the national paper, different groups, different list. The result was almost identical. Um, and when you're talking about such a large number of responses, so you're going, this is the one intervention we do on 100% of patients which is respond. Obviously, if we don't respond, there's no patient. Mm -hmm. So just because of that, when you have any of these interventions, they're relatively small numbers, and it turns out that you just don't do life-saving interventions all that often. And that was the thing that I found fascinating looking at the results is we're still seeing right around 7% of uh, LSIs. So um, I think it's probably the actual values will differ but I think overall the results are probably going to be the same. And that's one of the reasons I don't think everybody should adopt the same list. I think that list needs to be done locally. Number one, the results are going to be the same, but number two, you get buy-in in the local clinicians. And I think that's probably more important than anything. So we provided everybody a definition and it is called that type of uh, any intervention that one could reasonably expect to reverse a critical condition or rapidly improve hemodynamic stability. Now we did include here things that might not be considered an intervention. So for example, you mentioned STEMIs in PCI. I know it's gonna come as a huge shock to you, but even in Williamson County, in the great delegated practice state of Texas, we don't do PCI in the field. But we do do STEMI alerts. We do in Minnesota now. So well, of I course don't... you do. Right. Yeah. After you have uh, put them on ECMO. Yeah, once they're cannulated. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah, you just cannulate the legs and just keep right on going. That's absolutely. <laughs> no, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, we're not doing PCI in the field. And just in case anybody missed the, the humor in that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're also not uh, doing surgery. We're not giving thrombolytics for stroke. Um, so we included things like alerts. So STEMI alert, trauma alert, stroke alert, the things I call STREMIs, um, because those could conceivably decrease the amount of time 
to the life-saving intervention, even if we're not providing it. So we included that also. And we can um, just plop up on the page the list, but sure. uh, I'll give you some examples. We have anything that goes zap. Okay, that probably makes sense. Um, yeah. Cardioversion, defibrillation, car anything that gets at cardiac arrest, including mechanical CPR, anything that gets at... Uh, tension pneumothorax or pericardial tamponade. So pleural decompression, finger thoracostomies, uh, pericardiocentesis, that was included. And anything dealing with surgical airways. So eye gels, DSI, video laryngoscopy, surgical cricothyrotomies, those were all involved also. And then tourniquets, um, we added that. Uh, we have lots of versions of epinephrine for all the different versions we use. And we also have rocuronium. That seems probably relatively time sensitive, whether it is or not. I, you know, I argue a lot that we need to slow the hell down with our RSIs. Um, yeah. but we added that in there. We also added Narcan. Um, and some people may quibble about this. We am, added uh, amiodarone. Uh, we used amiodarone a lot for AFib, which, you know, wide complex AFib. Even and though. Bicarb too, right? I saw bicarb on there. I don't think. No, I'm we just kidding. Kind of <laughs> I got to tell you a different topic. I added, I just added Bicarb back into our cardiac arrest protocol. No, that's so, going to be a whole nother podcast. Absolutely. <laughs> Four limited indications, just to be clear. TCA. Um, thank you, Tanner Smita and uh, Dr. Meningazi for a great paper on that. So yeah, those are the things that we did. After looking at your paper and after this discussion, I guess everybody's wondering, like, because they're going to go to ship tomorrow. They're going to respond emergent if they get a 911 call. What's the next question that you think we need to ask? How do we take this and actually have, I want to say practice changing, because it, I do actually believe it's an intervention that's in our practice. What's the next thing we need to actually adopt this? Is it priority dispatching? That's been a thing for a while. Is that the next step is getting everybody on that? Or is there something else? So um, I don't know if you know uh, Dr. Jamie Kennel. He's a PhD sociologist, paramedic instructor in Oregon, well, now in Washington. Um, his big focus is on inequities in care. Um, he was a co-author with uh, Dr. Rimley Crow on a paper published last year, I guess, maybe the year before, in Annals, showing disparities by race in whether we give analgesia or not. Uh, yes, so I did read that. great paper, um, just, you know, depressing as hell, but it's a good paper. Right. And I asked him about, I actually asked him about this on uh, Lighthouse, my podcast. And I said, so Jamie, what do we do next? What's the next research paper that we can do to improve this? And he said, there's not one. This is no longer a research question. We know it exists. Stop telling me it exists. Now we need to find things that we can do to enact this, to make it better. I don't think that there is a question anymore that getting involved, well, there's no question that getting involved in a collision is bad. I think we would all agree, badometer, it's pretty pegged. It's a, right. not a good thing. But I think we also, it's fairly clear that you increase the risk of death and injury and certainly delay when you're using lights and sirens and you get involved in a collision. So the question is, how do we decrease the use of lights and sirens? I don't think it's an issue of how do we eliminate it? Because until we have 100% autonomous vehicles that just one car pings the next and says, please kind car, get out of my way. And it does mm -hmm. until that time, which will be long after all of us are dead, we're gonna need to use these things for some calls. So I really think it's a question about how do we get people aware of the issue and get them on board with it. And there are a couple of things that I think have, have happened here. Number one is there's actually a position statement um, that was put out. It was signed onto by probably going to get the number wrong. Matt Zavatsky is going to really haunt me and come <laughs> hurt me, but 14 or 15 organizations including the IFC, IFF, the Canadian Paramedics Association, ASEP, NAMSP, um, all of the organizations. And they said that lights and sirens are not needed for every call. Use them like a clinical intervention and use them only when they're indicated. Dr. Kupas was the lead author on that. 
Um, so also a Pennsylvania guy. Um, I think that we now know and our organizations admit that, yes, we need to do better. Then you get into a discussion of what's the best way to safely lower it. NIMSCO, an organization that I'm heavily involved with, the National EMS Quality Alliance, we um, hosted the first ever National Quality Improvement Initiative. And that is where we implement the model for improvement across 50 agencies. We get 50 agencies that are volunteering that says, hey, we want to make this safer for our colleagues and for the people on the road. How can we do this? And we just use the model for improvement to implement that. If you go to the NIMSQA website, and Tyler, I'll, I'll send you the, the link, you can see there is a book that uh, the folks at um, First Watch and the Red Flash Group put together that said, here is a summation of what we learned in this national quality improvement effort to make responses safer and then show the results. So um, great work. Uh, thank you to First Watch for sponsoring that and to um, the Red Flash Group who has some amazing writers um, that put that together. Um, so take a look at the NIMSCO website and just look at what some of those things are. This is a free book that's out there. Um, we really want to make it safe. But I think ultimately the first thing that has to happen is I think it's a culture change that we need to recognize that this is about our patients, it's about our partners, and it's about our families on the road when somebody else goes screaming by. Um, and I think the evidence now is fairly clear. We just don't need to go on every call like that. There is one other thing that I want to talk about because I, I view this fundamentally as a patient safety issue. And I was reading the comments of your question on Facebook before I got distracted. <laughs> yeah, and that's actually, that's where I was going with this, uh, with this after. Yeah. After so the, the big, in, just to head, I had it on Facebook and damn it, if they didn't hide it. Um, I want to say it was Dale Johnson who asked this, who made this point. Um, and he said it in a, yeah, it was. Um, and he said it in lots of ways, but the bottom line is that he said, License sirens are no license sirens. It's about how you drive. Um, so we need to focus on driver uh, training and you don't have to go 90 miles an hour. You don't have to be Dale Earnhardt when you're driving your ambulance. He is absolutely right. Um, I think I'm one of these people that think our patients deserve both oxygenation and ventilation, and we can do both <laughs> at the same time. I think we need to do multiple strategies to improve safety. It's not an either or situation. His point is so spot on. We have to continue to do everything we can to make responses and transports safer for everybody. And Dr. Jarvis, you know, just to piggyback onto that, you know, we were talking about kind of how we build this, uh, build this out, not just in initial education, but in ongoing education. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that we've talked a lot about here is, you know, how do we get to the call safely? How do we park the ambulance? All of those things. I think the flip side of this too is we have to start to build that model of how you provide good care in the safe environment of the back of the ambulance. So, you know, like, so Tyler, so you fly, right? So think about, think about like a new uh, flight paramedic orientee who's maybe been a paramedic for a couple years and they come to you uh, to start to onboard and, and orient and however you call that at LifeLink, right? So like for me, like the one thing that I always say is, okay, here's what we're going to do today. My goal, my first goal for you is like, let's just teach you how to walk to the helicopter, not fall down, get in, put your helmet on and buckle up. Like that's yeah. the first step, right? Don't walk. And then the once we have become, yeah. once we have become good at that, we'll go to the next thing. So one of the things that we've started doing in our EMT program is in addition to let's take you out and teach you how to drive, it's let's put you in the back and do simulation in the back of a moving ambulance that now teaches you how to provide XYZ care in a seatbelt. One of the big cultural obstacles that you know I have heard in my career, and I'm sure that it's no different for you guys, is I can't do X, Y, and Z in a seatbelt. Bullshit. Disagree. I now, are there things that are really hard to do in a seatbelt? Yes. 
the vast it's majority PPR. of things, however, Exa thank you. You can do. Yeah. And if you create a good mental model and think, okay, right now this person doesn't need this thing. But if they go this other direction, they're going to. I can prepare that stuff, you know, maybe before I get myself buckled in or whatever. And in the helicopter, they do that all the time. Hey, I'm coming unhooked for a second. Get your thing. Sit back down. Buckle back up. It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. You can do that in the back of an ambulance. But you have to build that mental model. And I'm just not sure that we talk about that enough. Because you know, that's the flip side of this whole paper. You know, what happens in the front is a really good thing. But if we don't, if we only ever talk about that and don't, build on what's happening in the back in a safe environment too, we're just going to go in a circle. Well, it's and that's walking and chewing gum. So one thing, because I deal with quality improvement a lot, the most effective quality improvement strategy and Jonathan, I'm an educator too. That's I ran programs before I went to medical school. I still consider myself first and foremost, a teacher. You're in recovery. I, I, I'm not even trying to be in recovery. I think it's the, one of the most important jobs in the world. And I'm, I'm proud to be a teacher. And this pains me to say, after I've said that, education is probably one of the least effective approaches to quality improvement. Yep. Um, the most improvement is engineering. So if you want to do exactly what you say, and that is increase the proportion of patients, patients, us where hopefully we don't become patients wearing seat belts we need to change the damn engineering in the back of the vehicle to enable that and find out why are people not wearing i guarantee well i can't guarantee this but i would say the odds are pretty high they wear their seat belt when they're in the front why aren't they doing it in the back culture certainly a part of it but i think the environment they work in we don't make it easy for them um, and there are engineering solutions to it. Take a look at the back of an ambulance in Europe. Oh my God, you probably wouldn't even recognize it. it it's not, God knows there are no bench seats. Um, it is structured in a different way and it's structured for safety. We can do that here. The, the manufacturers know how to do it. They're perfectly happy to do it, but they're kind of in business to sell units. And if people don't want to buy it um, because they don't recognize the importance, then they're going to keep making what they're making now. One of the other questions I had, you know, to do this effectively, you probably had, and you talked about this a little bit in your paper, you had to get some involvement and some buy-in from the from the elected officials, whether yeah. that be like county commissioners, mayor, like however that looks. You know, how did you present this to them so they understood the why behind what you were doing versus the ambulance doesn't care anymore? Yeah, you because know, because right. if they don't know, maybe that's how it comes off. You know, like to Tyler's sure. point, the ambulance sitting at the red light, and you're thinking, you know, go on. Yeah. Um, you know, how did you how did you explain that? How did you get that buy in? Well, we did, and I mentioned there were two separate groups. The, there's the group of clinicians who set the definition of a life well set the group the what constituted a life saving intervention, what those interventions were. The second group I didn't talk about, and thank you for bringing us back to that, Jonathan. Um, it included the EMS direct, it was a county based organization. So we provided EMS for the county and then, uh, the different municipalities provided fire first response. So we had fire chiefs who are representing their municipalities. Um, we had the EMS chief and we had county commissioners and we got them all together. And basically I reviewed the literature. I talked about the amount of time savings, including the work that we had done before. So that we're not doing life-saving interventions very often, that the vast majority of what we do, we don't have to be there three minutes faster, that lights and sirens don't save as much time as you think they do. And whatever your environment is, it's not saving as much as you think it is, unless you think it's three minutes and then you're probably exactly right. <laughs> so we told them all of that. And then I shared with them the evidence of increase collisions, increased harm, and increased lawsuits, by the way, for um, collisions with lights and sirens and said, ultimately, I'm not saying don't use them at all. I'm saying let's use our brain and use them when we need to. So all of them said, oh, that kind of makes sense. Then the question I had for them was given a any particular EMD code, doesn't matter which one, pick one, card 26, alpha, whatever. Um, given an EMD code, 
I am going to tell you the proportion of calls would that EMD determine it that had a, a life-saving intervention. But before I do, I want you to set a threshold. I'm asking you for a number. And what we're going to do is that number you give us that we all collectively agree on, and this has to be a consensus, above a, the proportion of life-saving interventions for that determinant that is above that threshold will go lights and sirens. Below that threshold will go no lights and sirens. The number they came up with, we, because I was on that, was 7.5%. So if you have 7.6% of all of your card 26 Delta 3s have a life-saving intervention done in the last year, and you should probably do this on an ongoing basis to right. see if it changes, then you go lights and sirens on that. If the number is five, you don't. And I told them that, look, we are going to miss some. It's going to happen by definition. Dispatch is triage, and there is no perfect triage, no matter what you're doing. So we're going to miss some. We're going to do everything we can to make it uh, accurate. And I'll share the, the ultimate results of the paper. Um, but we increased the accuracy. So just like we have a tendency to think about, well, there could be this case where they needed an intervention two minutes earlier and you could have gotten it except for the fact that she didn't use lights and sirens. Oh, my, we could be sued. Okay, well, first off, this is Texas. Um, it's kind of hard to successfully win malpractice lawsuits in Texas. Whether <laughs> you think that's good or bad probably depends on which side of the, the courtroom you're sitting on at the time. But I'm not that worried about the lawsuit. I know lots of people are. I'm way more worried about doing what's right. I think that we neglect the other harm, which is that we run over grandma with lights and sirens going to a sprained ankle. Um, and we have to think about both. We have to think about this in terms of sensitivity and specificity. Um, so when we say improve the accuracy, that means you want to go lights and sirens to the cardiac arrest, but not the ankle. And you got to have a mechanism of doing that. So, and I'm, let me, if you don't mind, let me just give you an idea um, we had 13, just under 14,000 calls in our uh, before group and 14,000 in the after group. And I will tell you, we had already made an attempt to decrease lights and sirens. We basically said Alpha and Bravo calls are no lights and sirens. Charlie, Delta, and Echoes are lights and sirens. Charlie, because we can't figure out what the hell's going on with them. So that's why they're Charlie. Um, so we were starting from a use um, we were using lights and sirens only 56% of the time to begin with. Um, after the intervention, that dropped to 28%. Um, time critical interventions, 7%, just like we found in the wow. other paper, which is the, the point that I don't know that it really matters which specific interventions you use. You're probably going to come up with a number somewhere between 6 and 8. Now, the overall accuracy, and the accuracy is defined – as essentially the hits over um, the misses, true, true positives, true negatives over false positives, false negatives. We went from 49% accuracy to 75% accuracy. And then the big thing is, oh, my God, response times are going to go through the roof. And response times did increase. They increased, let me check, the median 0.1 minute. That is yeah, that's nothing. six seconds. Yeah. Well, what about medians, you know, averages are horrible. Well, you must yes, have a frequent flyer that lives right next to the station or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's it. Now, granted, we mitigate that a little by using the 50th percentile, the median, but we calculated 90th percentile also. Um, and that was 0.3 minute increase. So it didn't change as much as we think it is. Now, I the other thing, because... You know, I started my career as an EMS clinician. I'm still a, I'm still a paramedic. Um, I still think like a paramedic before I think like a doctor. You know, what I want to know is, well, I know the limited amount of information the dispatcher has. If we get more information in call notes after we're dispatched, can I change the response? And I think 
I mean, this is just my opinion, uh, but it reflects the policy we had in Williamson County, and the answer is yes. So the responding clinician can upgrade or downgrade based on the inf- the totality of information they have available. Well, guys, this has been awesome. And uh, Jeff, I didn't mean to take up a whole hour of your time, man. But uh, Oh, man, you know was... I love this. I, and your phone didn't even ring. I, I am oh, amazed I'm sure at that. He's probably, on, he's probably on silent. He's got all sorts of people wondering if they should go ahead and push bicarb or give ketamine right now. But <laughs> Only early and unwitnessed non-shockable arrest. I believe that's the answer. <laughs> Awesome. Well, guys, thanks so much. Any concluding thoughts? Uh, Jonathan, any, anything else before we close it out? No, Jeff, this was great. It's always a pleasure to get to to get to chat with you when we have the opportunity about the work that you're doing. And uh, I really appreciate it. I, I work closely uh, where I live with Brian Maloney, who I know is also another uh, big advocate, a yeah. uh, big advocate for the same for the same similar projects through NEMSQUA and otherwise. So yeah. uh, it's, it's really great to see this from both sides. I appreciate the work you're doing. I think it's definitely game changing. Well, thank you very much. Um, Yeah, I think the closing thoughts I'll have just to summarize the point of the paper is to paraphrase a bumper sticker in Texas um, that you might have heard of. I'm not trying to pry your cold, dead fingers off of that federal siren. I'm not saying don't ever use it. I'm saying treat it like a clinical intervention and use it when it makes sense to use it. Use your clinical judgment. Use all of the tools we have. Because ultimately, all of us, we want to care for patients, but we can't do that if we're damaged, if we're hurt. Um, We can't do it if we're dead. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to our colleagues to do everything we can to do this job safely. Um, I want you all around for a long time, so please be safe.